Charles Purcell presents. Charles Purcell here. Happy to have you with us as always. Got something a little special today. We're going to devote the entire uh, half hour show to a uh, radio play, a radio story. It's called The Cleary Tree. It's the story of a brother and a sister and how they get separated and hopefully reunited. We won't give you give away the end. But it's about love and loss and learning about what's really important in life. It's a wonderful little story, a little allegory, written and performed by our own Peter Donalds, our musical director here at Charles Purcell Presents. Peter, anything you want to tell us about this? Uh... Well, yeah, it first aired, as you, I think you mentioned, this is the 25th anniversary. It first aired on KPFA in Berkeley, California. Right. And it began as a story. I used to improvise stories for my kids when they were young. I got tired of reading the same book, so I would just <laughs> improvise stories. And this okay. particular story about these two seedlings who grew up, I kind of liked it and remembered it long after I first told it to my kids. And I, th- and I thought, you know what, this might be something. So I wrote it into, into a radio play. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. I do all the voices and, you know, that. And, it, and I had a show at the time called Neo Radio. Right. The Neo Radio Hour on KPFA, the Pacifica affiliate in Berkeley, California, uh-huh. with my uh, partner, Frank, uh, who I've mentioned, I think, before, Frank Skillman, Skilly. Mm-hmm. So it aired on KPFA, and uh, and here it is, 25 years later, thought we'd, we'd offer it to a new audience. Very good. The Cleary Tree, written and performed by Peter Donalds. Music by Maggie Sansone. As landscapes go, this particular stretch of earth was typical and extraordinary. To the careful observer, every morning's light revealed a change or two, but this morning, even the most casual passers-by were struck by the transformation of things after a long, hard spring rain had lasted well into the night. Holy cow, look at this! That was some storm last Whoa, night! Whoa, look out for the puddle! Oh, you okay? Oh, this is a new skin, too. Yeah, I'm hungry. Let's go get yeah, something to too. eat. Yeah, it ought to be pretty good pickings today. Yeah, it should be. I hope we can beat the weasels. Oh, those weasels. Started. Yeah, they muscle yeah. in. You know what's that thing? I have no yeah, I want to say something, but I, I, you know, I don't know if I should. Well, you know, you got every right. I don't know what you think, think so? they are. I don't know. It's not too much. The tall grasses were bowed and beaded with crystal prism raindrops. The large, stately silver maples which surrounded the clearing appeared even more formal than usual in their black, rain-soaked bark. With the assistance of an accommodating sun and breeze, they showed off the bright underside of their new and abundant leaves like proud parents after Sunday service. A row of wild pimpernels opened their white petals to have a look. From the slope, small rivulets carved a hundred paths through which tree mites, poppy seeds, frog's eggs, and thousands of tasty critters washed to the banks of the gurgling stream as appetizers for the considerable crowd of jaybirds, salamanders, shrews, and graylings who had gathered among the cattails for breakfast and gossip. So, uh, where did you hide from the storm? In a tree. Oh, yeah, me too. Hey, did you hear about the rabbits? What? Nine of them didn't make it. No, really? Oh, that's too bad. So, uh, what are you doing later? I'm going to sleep on that rock over there. Oh, yeah, that's a good rock. Yeah. I've slept on that rock. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Among the million bits scattered by the storm were two helicopter seeds from one of the farthest and tallest silver maples. This pair, brother and sister, had flown together far into the clearing and landed just 30 paces from one another. Each of them, both of them, embraced by the black earth and tucked in gently by the softer drops of the waning storm. Brother and Sister Seed went unnoticed by the brunch crowd, but still any one of a thousand misfortunes could have ended their story right here. They could have easily been munched by a hungry deer mouse or upturned by a passing elk. By all rights, they should have been drowned by a second rainstorm or dried by the heat of the sun or nibbled by a horde of gnats or procured as building material for a blackbird's nest. Such was the fate of countless numbers of their cousins every spring. And yet... Against all odds, the two seeds became two seedlings. 
side by side, they took root, and side by side, they reached up, together. During the next few years, the twins swayed together in synchronized dance to every breeze. They stood up to every storm, enjoyed every sun-filled day, and heard every melody of every bird. Together they learned the rhythms of the year, when to change colors, when to drop leaves, and when to let sap flow. Though still very small, they were well-rooted and strong. Brother and Sister Tree loved each other very much, and by knowing each other they knew themselves. This was a rare opportunity for a tree, for trees are not normally known for self-awareness. As a rule, only we humans carry the burden of our own reflections. The Duke of Cleary looked in the mirror to take one last snip of the thick tuft of orange hair which he parted in the middle and cropped himself at the ears with his own shears. The Duke was a slight small-eyed man with disproportionately large hands and feet. His reflection told him he was in trouble. He called a meeting of his most trusted aides. The political landscape was changing too rapidly to suit the Duke of Cleary. From the west and the east, my land holdings are threatened, and my authority challenged. Now, advancing armies from the south have cleared the way for new foreign settlements. Soon, Cleary Castle itself will be in jeopardy. They decided the reconnaissance party should ride north. So, before the next sun, under a misty dark blue sky, the Duke of Cleary rode off to claim new lands, accompanied by a select group of 20 brave scouts, his architect, and his chief builder. Just before sunset of the 11th day, the entourage arrived at the landscape of Brother and Sister Tree. The trees stood quietly as the Duke approached. Halting his horse, just short of Sister Tree, the Duke raised his large gloved left hand in a kind of backward salute. The Duke dismounted, his company followed suit, and while bones were stretched and thirsts were quenched, the Duke surveyed the landscape. Architect! Chief Builder! Come forward, please! Removing his plumed hat and blue leather gloves, the Duke combed his long fingers through his sweaty orange tuft and ambled forward, nearly stepping on Sister Tree. Brother Tree winced. The Duke continued several paces, turned to his aides, slapped his gloves in the palm of his hand, for effect, and shifted his weight, rather awkwardly, to the left. Well, architect, what do you think? Yeah, 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 I think this will do perfectly. I see the main castle there, good, uh, good. southern exposure, Course. towers, towers are good, yes. uh, the courtyard extending to there, uh -huh. the main wall uh, the here. Main wall. Yes, the court wall. How high, architect? Oh, I'd say about 20 feet. 20 feet? Oh, no, 30 at least. My men and I can get all the stone you need, Sir Duke. We just passed that large quarry this morning. My thoughts exactly, Chief Builder. Indeed, you will get all the stone I need. Make it. Fifty feet high. 50 now that feet might be a problem, high. Sir Duke. You see, Architect, with that kind of you will design a fifty-foot wall surrounding the entire castle and courtyard. Fifty feet and not one inch less. And Chief Builder, I want it built right here. With a punctuating stamp of his large boot, the Duke pointed to the exact spot where he stood. Brother and Sister Tree swayed forward to look at one another. The diminutive Duke of Cleary was standing directly between them. The usual songbird and cicada symphony which adorned the landscape gave way to a cacophony of hammers and pulleys, shouts of foremen and workers, and a thousand workings from teams of workhorses pulling giant stone-laden carts. Brother and sister tree were nearly trampled numerous times by the throngs of workers and beasts, wheels, ramps, and stone, but always bounced back and survived. To tell it true, 
being trampled was the least of their worries. Before long, the 50-foot wall rose up between them. Quiet, quiet please, quiet everyone, there you are. Congratulations, yes, congratulations all around for a job well done. Cleary Castle is complete. Construction has ended. And we did it in only 10 years. Kudos, special kudos to architect and chief builder. Architect, chief builder, come on, take a bow. Come on up here. Here, 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 here. With its military and economic houses in order, the House of Cleary was safe, its dominion assured. The Duke of Cleary could turn his attention to the finer things. Landscape artist, come forward. Hey, landscape artist, the Duke wants you. Yes, sir, did. Landscape artist, you and your team are called upon to design the castle gardens in a manner befitting the high prestige and power of its inhabitants. Yes, sir, Duke. Play, musicians. Eat, everyone. Plenty of mutton and onion stew to go around. Be merry, revel and all that. Good, good. The next morning was bright and cheery over the landscape. But without Sister Tree these past ten years, Brother Tree's life was incomplete. His beloved sibling, just thirty paces away, might as well have been thirty miles. He could not see her new leaves in the spring or her fine colors in the fall. He was relatively certain she had not been chopped for firewood. She would surely be too small for that, and he hadn't heard the woodsman's axe. But still, without sight or sound, he could not be absolutely certain. Everything reminded Brother Tree of his sister. The sweet, earthy smell of loam after a rain, the drone of dragonflies, the rainbow of wildflowers on the slope, the chipped voices of beavers, and the faint, subtle padding of their tails on mud and wood. The wonder of these daily miracles, once shared with Sister Tree, Brother Tree now felt in solitude. Still solemn and lovely, but no longer joyful. Brother Tree still danced in the breeze, though he did not want to. He had to dance, it was his nature. But he knew that the great wall blocked the breeze, and that his sister did not dance with him. Sister Tree with only a bare stone wall and courtyard as her constant view, had, for the most part, lost any memory of the lush and ever-changing landscape. Her only sounds were the constant drums and marching of courtyard military exercises. Her only aromas the combination of boiling soap, sheep dung, and the Duke's favorite mutton and onion stew. As more and more rings covered her center ring, even the image of Brother Tree left her conscious memory. For Sister Tree, Brother Tree had become a deep, uncomfortable longing, an unidentified sadness, which she could neither release nor define. Sister Tree discovered that she felt this melancholy most sharply when looking at the sky, so she stopped looking at the sky. Her gaze and her branches and her leaves and her spirit hung heavy and always downward. This tree is pathetic. Why are you so sad, little tree? My goodness, you're the only tree in the courtyard. We just need to perk you up a little bit is all. Landscape artist circled Sister Tree several times with a sweeping gait, the drapes of his long coat wafting behind him like the tail of a kite. Landscape artist studied Sister Tree carefully. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is the key to the whole courtyard. Are you taking this down, Leopold? His assistant, Leopold, a squat, perspiring, barefoot boy of 13, took notes with a sharpened piece of coal and dried sheepskin. I mean, after all, this is the main entrance. What must people think? Yes, this tree will be our centerpiece. Some lilacs there and there, a path of pimpernels here. Let's find some place else for these sheep, shall we? A meditation garden, perhaps? Yes, yes, a meditation garden with shade provided by our beautiful... <clears throat> oh, sweetheart, Miss Maple, you are in some sorry condition. What have they done to you? 
Oh, well, not to worry. We'll fix you right up. A little sheep dung fertilizer, some pruning here and there, regular water. The drainage here is dreadful. Throw some soft light on you, and voila! Come on, Leopold, we've got work to do! Landscape artist, his assistant Leopold, and a team of workers did wonders with the castle courtyard. Trellises and fine sculptures were strategically placed to cast moving ornamental shadows by day. A carefully designed pattern of torch lights glowed by night. Sweet scented oils burned perpetually. An exotically carved hedge sprayed with violets, goldenrod, primrose, and bluebell bordered the coral crested waterway, which was fed by a series of fountains. Every line of the magnificent courtyard was designed to lead the eye directly to Sister Tree, for which the landscape artist himself had taken personal responsibility. Sister Tree was transfigured into the main attraction of what was now the most beautiful courtyard in the known world. Every limb strong and in place, every bright leaf with its best face forward, Sister Tree was a picture, healthy and vibrant, watered by an elaborate system of silent mist, nutrient-rich compost at her roots, appendages pruned and preened 24 hours a day. She was truly a tree for the ages. The garden's grand unveiling brought the elite from kingdoms far and wide. Embraced by all who saw her, for years to come, Sister Tree would be known as the Cleary Tree, for she was as fine and admired as the Duke of Cleary was powerful and feared. Brother Tree awoke with a violent pulsing in his center ring which frightened him. Sister Tree had lived there peacefully now for fifty years. What was this sudden burst? Just a dream, Brother Tree concluded. As they did every day, Sun and Breeze helped Brother Tree with his morning ablutions known in the more base circles of the landscape as shaking off the dew. Finished with the first part of the ritual, he raised himself to take a deep breath, but stopped short when he noticed something new and very important. His uppermost branches were nearly to the top of the castle wall. Brother Tree had never considered the possibility of reaching such a height. As a tree, he never thought about growing. He realized he was taller than he'd been last year and the year before. But somehow for trees, unlike humans, the events of the past are never transformed into aspirations for the future. Rather than our three-dimensional concept of time, i.e. past, present, and future, trees are blessed only with two dimensions, past and present. Trees don't make plans. Trees are historians not politicians. <laughs> Sister Tree looked down at the Duke of Cleary and his court as they picnicked in the shade of her great boughs. The Duke was now old and frail. His once great thick orange tuft reduced to a few long stubborn yellow strands like the silk that clings to husked corn. The Duke's grandchildren amused him with improvised stories and long stocking hand puppets. Sister Tree, stronger and healthier than ever, still only looked down. But as she looked down, Sister Tree knew that all that was around her was not of her. The leaves and seeds she dropped, Leopold swept regularly into the bin once each morning and once each afternoon. She felt no kinship to the elaborate gardens and fountains which landscape artists had designed and with whom she had shared the courtyard for so many springs. She and they were more invention than creation. Sister Tree knew these things, but did not know she knew them. She could not fashion the thoughts in her mind as the Duke's grandchildren fashioned their puppet story. She only felt the longing, as always, from deep in her center ring. She was a tree, and a tree is what it is. Without thinking, Sister Tree looked up. 
to the sky. Night fell. Brother Tree looked at the wall. He could not help but think that if he were just a bit taller, he could be reunited with... Oh, no, it was an impossible thought. Not at all in his nature as a tree. Every tree is, by definition, the best and only possible tree it can be. For a tree to want to be anything other than what it is, is antithetical to the whole notion of treeness. And yet, he could not help himself. It was the first time Sister Tree had looked up since her earliest days inside Cleary Castle. The dark gray moonless sky and memories it concealed generated a sharp pain that went through Sister Tree like a bolt. But before she was able to look away, she made an astounding discovery. Her highest branches rose to the top of the castle wall. Her center ring swelled as if it would burst, the sensation reached the end of her roots and seemed to actually vibrate the ground below Cleary Castle, just as a neat row of white potted pimpernels closed their petals. You, cover the torches! You take the statues inside! Let the statues commence by the storm! William, I'll help you! The the strongest work! A sudden violent spring storm had erupted in the night. While the Duke's workers frantically scurried to protect the castle and gardens, Brother Trees and Sister Trees' gaze stayed fixed on the tumultuous heavens. Swaying and swirling with the clouds, their limbs bucked and leaped. Each of them felt as if the wind would pull them up from their roots. Pummeling rain and flying debris mattered little, though as Brother Tree and Sister Tree held tightly to their center ring, from which they drew strength, certainty, and a quiet, intense calm. Yeah, boy, that was some storm last night. I'll say it was. It'd be a pretty nice spread this morning, though. Could be, yeah. Everything was churned up by the flood. Oh, hey, look at this. Oh, hey, what did I tell you? Oh, oh, it all looks so good. Oh. Hey, 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 now, now, don't, don't fill up on worms now. You know what that does to you. Oh, you're such a worry water. Chief Builder, I say, Chief Builder, have you assessed the damage? Oh, well, you know, it looks um, looks pretty bad, Sir Duke. Uh, the tornado took off most of the roof and sucked out half the interior structure. Ah. And if that wasn't bad enough, the rushing waters really did a job on the foundation. Uh, I don't think it's worth fixing. I think oh. we'd better move on. Well, well, I'm much too old for that, Chief Builder. Architect! Where is that good? Architect! Right here, Sir Duke. Architect! Yeah, you're right here, Sir ah, Duke. Talk to me. Well, Sir Duke, uh, according to my structural analysis, uh, we're pretty well done for. Uh, Cleary Castle is going to crumble under its own weight. Uh, yeah, yeah. How long have we got, Architect? Oh, optimistically, I'd say about ten years. Ten years? Hell, we'll all be dead by then. To tell the truth, I'm surprised we're still alive as it is. Patch it up best you can, Chief Builder. What? We'll live out our days here, and I'll let the kids decide where to go next. Good man. Off you go to work with it now. Somebody get me a towel. Hey, hey, where are you three going? My, what, what am I supposed to do with this mess? Where are you going? I, I need some support here. My work. Oh, my beautiful work. Landscape artist, alone in the courtyard, fell to his knees in the slop that was once his garden showplace. His chin in his chest, he opened his eyes and saw a strange vision. Light and shadow dancing wildly on the muddy courtyard floor beneath him. He looked up and saw the once magnificent Cleary tree, free from ornamentation, tall and wild, reaching far over the castle wall, her upper branches entwined with brother tree. Sun smiled on them, breeze moved them. 
they danced with abandon. The flood of beauty and memory which had stirred from Sister Tree's center ring now reached the very limits of her highest and smallest spring. She was again part of the landscape. Many years have passed. The Duke of Cleary and his court are long gone. The Duke's children, with grandchildren of their own, have long since relocated. Cleary Castle eventually crumbled, just as architect had foretold. But the landscape remains, as do brother and sister tree. Old and stately, yet strong, rooted firmly, they rise high above this typical and extraordinary stretch of earth. To the careful observer, every morning's light reveals a change or two. But even the most casual passers-by are sometimes struck by the transformation of things after a long, hard spring rain. The Cleary Tree, written and performed by our own Peter Donalds. Music by Maggie Sansone. The Cleary Tree first aired 25 years ago on KPFA in Berkeley and the Pacifica Network nationwide. So the 25th anniversary of The Cleary Tree. Next week, back to uh, the regular show, if, if a regular show indeed uh, actually exists. I'm not sure. But we'll get back to uh, the regular nonsense. See, the whole idea of Charles Purcell presents, the presents part is uh, we can present whatever we want. And often we'll do something a little different. In the meantime, again, thanks to Peter Donalds for this offering and for his uh, music each week. Find this and every episode and more at the website charlespurcell.com. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter. You know how that works. Listen and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform. Just search Charles Bursell Presents. There it is. Thanks for listening. See ya. <laughs>